at the time, right? Because we have a deadline of trying to close it within the two years, two and a half years period that we had started. Uh, so uh, that I'll just give a background of what this event is because a lot has changed in this uh, last four months. So we had batch of MBA students graduate. We had a batch of MTech students graduate. New people have come who have not attended these events here. So there's a lot of things that have changed in between. Of course, the government also got formed again. So you can see that you know informal slots can change. Uh, so let's give us uh, give the background of what these events are. So uh, we, we do this uh, civil jubilee. We are doing civil jubilee talks, saying that we'll do 25 events uh, to uh, because the department started a year after when this program started. So that gives us the two-year period where we can celebrate over a two-year period of time. At the same time, we decided that we'll do 25 of these so that at each event we'll focus on one batch will join from where they are and at least tell us where they are, right? So we'll get to hear their journeys also. The format of the event is also such that we didn't uh, want to make it a uh, lecture series, and that's why it's uh, only each panelist gets only 10 minutes. Uh, but we want to hear their stories because uh, design is about journeys and uh, learning over a period of time, and hopefully we'll hear from each of them what their journeys have been, uh, and that's what we are looking at. By the end of uh, these 25 events, we'll have heard 100 design experts from the academy of practice, and so on, and uh, we'll end up with a catalog, a coffee table book, which will say what these hundred people have talked about in design. So that's also the idea. So all of this gets uh, documented. Of course, uh, these videos will also be on YouTube for people to access. So it's been live streams. Occasionally, we have had technical issues in the live stream, but we clean up the videos and put it back again. Right. So with that background, I'll invite uh, Professor Sain to come and briefly talk about. Uh, uh, briefly talk about the history of the department. So I'll put up the slides. You can feel it today as well. Let me just put up the slides. So it is like almost saying things about ourselves to ourselves. Yeah, very few people here are not us. Okay, so therefore it is about uh, reminding ourselves the journey and uh, appreciate the difficulties and achievements uh, gives us aspiration to keep the trend moving up. And for those who are from outside of uh, our department or institute, they get to see that uh, how, where we started and where we stand, and in between what we proudly claim as achievements. Okay, our achievements are not always in terms of uh, say accolades only, but also uh, significant milestones through which uh, the department has gone. Okay, so it started in uh, 1997 as a program uh, hosted in mechanical engineering department where faculty from other departments did uh, actively support the program through uh, teaching courses and giving projects. Uh, those departments were erstwhile CEDT management. Uh, that time it was called metallurgy. Okay, now it is materials engineering, they say, and management. But in the meantime, we are not even existing. Now we not only exist, but we also transformed uh, from started as CPDM, Center for Product Design and Manufacturing, with only one pro program in it. That's right. It was called Center. We had only MDS program, no research. And our batch size to start with was only 10 students. Our first batch got maybe eight or nine students. And after that, we got the full strength. Because in the beginning, no, people also, uh, but that interview, right, 97 interview, I still remember, right? We were so rigorous, students were so very interested by these candidates. It went on till, even though there were not too many candidates, it went on till late in the evening uh, interviews. 
and some of the uh, notable candidates, right, will not leave the interview room. Okay, that was the type of commitment and interview, the uh, involvement before they got selected. That I'm not satisfied, sir. Ask me a few more questions. Even if you don't take me, doesn't matter. But ask me a few questions like that. And someone came running and they said, sir, can I still join? My train got late and I am extremely late now. I look at all the long shoes, right? You can uh, sit, we'll take the interview. So that was 1997. 1998, the department got formed uh, because uh, it was through the, it is a proposal from Mechanical Only that it is a very interesting program, but that it does not suit the type of programs that Mechanical Engineering runs. So they do not find connection, right? So uh, we were already asking for our identity to be given as a department and mechanical told that, you know, it is better that this type of program is getting an individual independent identity. And hence in 98, it was granted and we uh, came to this building and it was at that time a abundant workshop. Okay, so much so that in 2003, when our first chairman retired, and he, with very sad connotation, told that although he started the program and we did quite well, he said that so far as infrastructure is concerned, my notable contribution is providing a clean toilet to my students. Okay, so before that, even a good toilet was not there. Okay, uh, so that was the situation from which he started. These buildings actually do not say that. Okay, it was an abundant workshop. This was used to be a two storeroom where all the inventory used to be kept, right? This was carpentry. This open area was carpentry. And where this our building is now, that was a machine shop. Okay, and this side where the broken pieces are there, it used to be a 12 foundry because uh, this was a, you know, uh, that uh, kind of a uh, place, right? Yeah, so that is where we uh, started. It was uh, by no means, you know, uh, resembling any of the design departments, right? We cannot even say it is a green field project, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so it was very difficult start, but we were very, very sure that this is something that our country needs. Okay, so uh, hence we, even though difficulty was there, we continued our uh, journey. Why now? You see that this is no mean achievement in the last 25 years from where we started, that we proudly say that, you know, now we count among the top in the world, right? So that is the, you know, other numbers are uh, already written. You know, uh, this is, uh, and by now we have already graduated more than 400 and the students, not a big number by world standard by you know, but considering that we first had only eight to 10 students, right? And that all continued for some time, right? So it was quite uh, good. And uh, we did not have any research uh, program here. In 2005, uh, something like that, 2003 or 2005, we had the uh, first research student that too, we did not have permission to take research student. So we took students from other departments, through other departments, they were attached to the faculty here. Okay, it took another two years to take our own student because departments through which we are taking the students, they did not appreciate our type of questioning the research students. But these, these are not kind of questions in a research student should be asked, right? So these are valuable for us, right? So we got our own chance. In 2005, we started and we have now 75 plus uh, PhD and MSc. Is this a... MSc is what now is called MTech by research. Our latest to be called MSc engineering. Okay, and uh, we have a significant amount number of awards and recognition patents, right? And this patent is you consider that patent was not in vogue at that time when you started, right? It is after four or five years when you started boasting ourselves. People started asking if you are doing that great. Why don't you see things in the market? Right? What is meaning of market? 
right? So then we started applying for patents and then students also gradually picked up and things like that. So that is the journey uh, about the uh, patents. And recently we also started the program on uh, smart manufacturing. It is quite uh, new by uh, other, considering the other uh, uh, activities that is started with, uh, earlier. And it is also completely different flavor. So, you know, we started small, but now we have reasonable number of population even within that. What next? Does it progress? Yeah. And these are the some of the recognition, right? The Red Dot Awards and, uh, you know, uh, Times Magazine 25 special mention, best inventions. And these are all about uh, our students, um, uh, Munna Sharma, Govind Anup, and James Dyson Award, Devil Korea for that uh, life box, which carries uh, uh, harvested organs uh, over a large distance. That means it can keep uh, it uh, alive in that sense, viable. They call it viable uh, because it actively uh, pumps nutrient to that. Okay, and this one, the Ujjalango runs, that device which looks like something you know, crazy, but it is actually a, a, a very uh, narrow and small thing, right? It goes inside the drains and cleans it to, uh, you know, get the manual scavenging of this um, from water drains, the sewage drain system, right? It removes the clogs and all this stuff for robotic. It gives feedback, you know, you operate it from ground up, okay, from some screen, okay? Yeah, so then, uh, they then started the journey of our students towards their own company, right? And uh, these are the two special mentions, but there are many others, okay? Uh, one of the reason is that um, maybe we have not updated the slides, uh, uh, completed the slides, right? So we have much um, uh, more brighter uh, stories. Uh, Sickle Innovations is a agri-tech company uh, which uh, serves for the uh, farmers with less than five uh, hectares of land, which is a predominantly the small farmers. And this is very much like continuous interaction with them, serve for them, deliver them, test there. Okay, it is not like mass production and let me see who buys. Okay. And in recent years, so these are the, are the some of the, uh, yeah, the special uh, awards and conferences, participation in that best proper awards and all. So what it shows is that both in research, innovation, design, and uh, all other aspects of our activities, right? Our students have uh, shown that uh, you know, this place is uh, good, right? So you should also be uh, feeling proud uh, about being here. Okay, a distinguished paper award by uh, Nas LD. This is very important, interesting and important because we did not have foreign students uh, till recently, right? Maybe she's the first uh, foreign student or something? Foreign PhD student, yeah. Uh, before that, we had visiting uh, foreign students uh, for who used to come here for a month or sometimes uh, one semester, right? But uh, she's the first uh, PhD student from abroad and uh, she also got a distinguished paper award. In which conference is, okay, it is an, a design conference. This is the most renowned uh, conference prestigious conference in design. And uh, what we produced uh, through research and design, right? And these are some of them who are now in uh, faculty positions. I'm saying some of them because this is also not exhaustive because if I make the list uh, exhaustive, then the faces will not be very much uh, seen. Okay, so only thing it shows is that most of the IITs are covered and we also, uh, have representation abroad, uh, Texas A&M, Brits Pilani, and etc. Napier in UK, okay, and uh, he was also there earlier. <laughs> we snatched him from there. Yeah, otherwise his picture will be there. <laughs> One has become live here. <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, and after all this, you know, this became uh, important to uh, set our goal straight and explicit. Okay, till now we are implicitly doing some things. So it's said that, you know, it is uh, good to make ourselves explicit such that we also have a direction and people who wants to know about us, they also see which direction we are going. 
Okay, so we had a uh, long day of discussion away from institute. We went such that we'll relieve ourselves from the influences that is here and discussed over uh, you know thing like what we stand for, what we are aiming at, right? So that's why our DM's uh, vision at the time to CPDM. We still did not get the graduation to DM. Uh, pursue excellence in education, research, and practice in areas of design and manufacturing, so as to support the development of systemically complex, technologically intensive, socially impactful solutions that are functional, aesthetic, usable, and sustainable. Okay, and uh, this was there even in the very first paragraph. Uh, our department used to say that you know that was our USP that uh, we. <laughs> that to use the word, we focus everywhere. It is something like one tailor who wrote that specialist in all kind of garments. Right? <laughs> if you are specialist in everything, then you are not a specialist. Okay, but we also aim that that our students should know the all aspects of design from functionality, aesthetics, uh, and uh, also be socially resp uh, responsive. Okay. Uh, these are two of uh, three conferences, right? Two conferences. <laughs> yeah, I said, and no, so the ICOD and uh, I4M. So I4M is after the manufacturing uh, program started, but ICOD started, I think, uh, 2006, right? It is uh, uh, every two years, right? And earlier it is to be exclusively in institute. Uh, and now, for last uh, maybe uh, 10, 10 years back, it, we, you know, it was uh, decided that it will be alternately within institute and some other place outside institute, mostly hosted by IITs, uh, an alternate year. And uh, this is now one of the you know, most uh, prestigious uh, design conference where uh, very, very significant participation from abroad is there. Very few number of international conferences which are located in India have that much amount of mass participation as also widespread participation as I card. And I hope that uh, one of these days I4AM will also get to that scale. Yeah, so now it is, uh, and CFC, Smart Factory Design Innovation Center, Citizen of Excellence are some of the uh, you know, major uh, initiatives, uh, mostly funded by Government of India that has uh, started uh, here and uh, they are still continuing. Okay, so now over to Vishal. Thank you. All right, so with that, we now uh, come to the core agenda. Uh, we've already seen it uh, and now we have all the panelists here. And so uh, without uh, getting any further, uh, You've seen the posters, uh, and these are all experts. Uh, and I'm glad that we, and we are glad that they are here with us. Uh, two here, two online. Uh, and as has been our uh, practice, we'll start with those who are online, especially those whom we have woken up very early, right? So with that, I'll invite uh, Vivek to uh, please uh, put up his slides, and uh, I'll just unshare mine so that uh, you can. And in the while you do that, or while we do that, okay, something happens here. All right, so I'm unsharing my slides. Uh, Vivek, if you could please put up yours, and in the meanwhile, I'll just uh, briefly read his short bio, uh, and of course, you can look at his profile and his company later. So Vivek Reddy uh, is a CEO and co-founder of uh, Viga Entertainment Technology. Uh, he is a passionate uh, filmmaker and technologist based in Bangalore, uh, with a solid foundation in electronics and communication engineering and a master's in computer graphics and game technology from the University of Pennsylvania. Vivek uh, has melded his love for film and technology into a notable career. Noteworthy is his contribution to the virtual production tools for the Lion King movie with uh, Magnapus and Disney. Uh, under his leadership, Viga has created AI tools, movie collab, script viz, and pioneering virtual production solutions for seamless film production. So uh, great to have you, Vivek. Uh, and uh, of course, we'll have you here again once you're back in Bangalore for longer sessions. Uh, but uh, we'd love to hear from you now. All right. All right. Okay, you can see my screen, right? I mean, it's an empty screen right now, but uh, yes, you can see yes, we can. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me uh, on this, Professor Vishal. And uh, 
all the panelists. Thank you. Uh, so uh, a quick uh, uh, notice. Yeah, I just uh, I, I, while while you're going through uh, you know IASC's journey, I was just thinking like, uh, okay, where do I fit in? Uh, you know, as from coming from movies and uh, games and interactive media, and uh, you know, it it just occurred that yeah, there is a lot of design that we also do. Like uh, I thought, like I'll just go over like what all uh, design phases that we go in. So I just wanted to tell a story of like, what is my journey? What is the company's journey? And in the process, I'll just go through the design challenges of uh, the whole journey in the next, like, you know, next 10 minutes. So yeah, I, I started my journey uh, from University of Pennsylvania in uh, computer graphics. It was going mostly into the technical side of things of filmmaking, of uh, rendering and uh, actually, uh, you know, going all the 3ds Max routes of CAD data or anything kind of that sort of pipeline is what we were into. And then uh, we started designing uh, for uh, game cinematics. Uh, you know, uh, any any game requires marketing material, but uh, you need to actually design those cinematics from the game engine itself. That was like the first entry into the cinematic side of things and a bunch of movies along the route. And then. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, think about the design aspects of things because, uh, you know, in the advertising sector in 2016, uh, we had to implement uh, advertising inside virtual reality. So that was one of the big challenge in, in the career, like uh, uh, how do you incorporate like real time advertising inside uh, VR while the experience is in the 3D world? And then in 2017, I had a chance to work with uh, Google again. Uh, this time it was uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. We, we did a music video in 360 degrees. Uh, so this time it was mostly, okay, how do you engage an audience in 360 degrees and uh, design in a way where spatial audio can help you, uh, you know, focus on uh, the, the new way of uh, media and entertainment, right? So instead of a 2D screen, like how do you engage somebody in 360 degrees? That was the next set of challenges. And then uh, a Lion King happened in Lion King, uh, the next, the the biggest problem statement was okay. You need to shoot a film in uh, in a in a given space, just like an animated movie or like an avatar kind of a movie. But uh, but ex except that in avatar you had uh, uh, like real humans wearing motion capture suits and acting for you. But you had to design a system uh, uh, which had to accommodate for animals, and uh, you had to shoot this entire film using virtual reality. So. The design aesthetics here were mostly what are the interaction tools between uh, uh, you know filmmakers in Hollywood versus usage of technology. Like where do you draw the line? Because uh, you don't have to be you know uh, gobbled up with technology and the tools and pipelines, uh, uh, especially if you're a filmmaker. You, you you need that layer of shield around you where you just you do your art. And the, the tech and the pipeline takes over from there on. So you have to design a proper uh, hardware software system. I can go into detail later on, like you know when we have when we have any discussion timelines. And then I I, I felt like okay, it's time for uh, India to do great films. Uh, and uh, great films in the sense, uh, yes, India does uh, good movies. Uh, Story wise, there are good movies in India as well. But when it comes to like I'm I'm particularly a science fiction. Uh, uh, fan of uh, movies and uh, if you have to enable such quality movies like what does it take to do it uh, like uh, it all starts with so many other things but I'll I'll go over them uh, this is the next slide I just wanted to go over so we started we started a company in Bangalore called Vega Entertainment Technology and the goal was to focus on uh, uh, just entertainment and uh, building technology for it uh, like it will be hardware and software uh, and both have a lot of design components, obviously, uh, starting from scratch in the world of movies, uh, where India actually does not do much in the world of movies at all. Like you take cameras, you take lenses, you take any equipment that was being shot in the movies that we do in this country, we import pretty much everything. And there's a very big problem with that because in the West, when they actually do movies, when they, when they have Canon and Nikon and Sony around here, they customize things. Uh, the products are actually customized and de redesigned for the sake of accommodating how to shoot those movies. So, uh, so one of the biggest philosophies is uh, 
you have to build your products and design things locally if you have to you know have control on like where your final art form actually can go towards so that was like the philosophy which we started so so we started working with hotstar as well uh, on a tv show for which we had to design aerial uh, sequences uh, again it will come into the world of cinematography but you had to build tools uh, hardware and software again to do virtual camera and things like that and then uh, and then we were part of one of the biggest uh, it we can say this is one of the biggest design projects we were part of called uh, dubai expo city so expos happen uh, every 5 years across the world uh, all the way from the paris eiffel tower uh, to the launch of uh, television uh, big events happen at uh, expos so this time uh, it happened in uh, dubai expo city it was delayed by a year due to covid but uh, Dubai Expo City was focused on like uh, like a metaverse kind of a world building, like use case of actual uh, digital twins. So uh, even though we did not design that world, we were uh, uh, we had to build the functionality of like working along with Google and scanning the world. Uh, and when users walk in this uh, augmented reality world, we had to make sure the technology works in such a way that we identify where you are accurate, not not using GPS, but much more accuracy. So that you know, we you can have augmented reality on top of the real world. So uh, it's it's incredible. You can go check out online what we were able to achieve. And then we had uh, we worked on a, a film Vikrant Rana where we had to work on digital twins. Uh, digital twins uh, were not popular in India, so we uh, we had to build a hardware that can scan humans and then uh, use those digital humans into film making. And with uh, in with Rahman sir, we were working on uh, short films, and we we launched products. Uh, we launched uh, completely designed in India products uh, for movie production management. Uh, one of the biggest uh, problem statements that we had to solve was in India, not many were using uh, uh, production management because uh, India was using WhatsApp, Google Drive, and that such kind of workflows, uh, which is it, which is where. Uh, you know, it's very hard to manage movies. Movies are like extremely digital these days. Uh, every shot has like, um, you know, gigabits, gigabits of information, which you have to sort out and actually uh, make it feasible for everybody in the system to, to work seamlessly with each other. So it's more of a communication tool that we had to build. And, uh, uh, and uh, India had never built a production management software. So that's the uh, that's the biggest thing that we had to solve. So, so we built it from that. That's that's the first thing that we did when I came back. Uh, you know, from day one, uh, for five years we built uh, this like at a at a really good quality, so that we have real time analytics uh, available and like a in, and and like a social media kind of uh, workflow where people uh, across the company when working on a movie will have more more say on a uh, on the film itself rather than just being passive or and art works really good if uh, everyone collaborates and everyone has a visibility on what is what is that we are building rather than you know having like microscopic uh, view on their just their task so we we had that as a philosophy when we went in and uh, yeah we started making short films and uh, we are working on more uh, amazing con content and technology right now but a lot of it is in nda right now last one year but uh, some of the biggest things is after movie collab, we we launched another software called ScriptWiz. It's a generative AI software. What it does pretty much is uh, uh, upload your script, and we will automatically go through the script using an LLM and give you short breakdown using like a film director. And then we'll do storyboards. And uh, in that, there are a lot of technical problems. Uh, again, user interface is very important when AI is there. AI uh, can generate good output, but you need creative control. Uh, is what many artists would uh, ask for. So it requires a kind of uh, rethinking on how design works uh, on the web. So that's like an overall journey of uh, what we have done. Uh, over to you, Professor Vishal. Uh, thank you, Vivek. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, we'll, we'll hold on the questions for now. So we'll go through all the uh, presentations uh, and then we'll come back to the questions. So thanks again. Uh, I'm glad that you are well awake and it was a very nice presentation knowing what uh, you have been doing. So uh, with that, I'll ask our next presenter, uh, Arun, again, uh, being online. So uh, we'll go to him. Uh, and uh, if you could put up your slides. Uh, uh, in the meanwhile, I'll give a brief, brief bio. So Arun Kumar Francis uh, 
is an alumni of CPDM, so that's uh, you know it's, it's always good and great to hear uh, alumni doing well. Uh, his batch of 2007-2009, his experience in uh, in motorcycle design spans over a decade and a half. He's currently working for Bajaj Auto Limited and is the designer behind the latest uh, launch Freedom, the world's first ground-up CNG motorcycle. Uh, he's also worked uh, for other two-wheeler manufacturers like TVS Motors, where he has designed bikes like RR310. Uh, Phoenix, the Akula concept, and the Draken concept. He is currently pursuing a master's degree in Indian history from the University of Madras. Uh, he's an avid motorcyclist and uh, has a keen interest in comic book illustrations, all of which were very evident when he was a student here as well. Yeah, so please uh, go ahead, Darun. Sure. I'm audible? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Happy to be uh, part of. Uh, this exercise. Uh, I wish I had been there in person. It would have been much, uh, I mean, it's always a tricky presenting to an audience where I see myself. <laughs> I don't see you guys, but any which ways. Uh, I'm happy. So I'm Arun Kumar Francis. I'm a motorcycle designer by uh, profession. And uh, I am from the batch of uh, 2007 9 from CPDM. And uh, so what I thought was I'll split the presentation into two. Uh, the first half, I'll talk about uh, what I do, as in what does a motorcycle designer do, and what are the process, what kind of uh, design goes behind the design of motorcycles, uh, story of that. And then the second half is something more important for you guys, uh, what you can do, as in like if uh, interested people who want to pursue a career in a similar line, what you guys can pick up or uh, look for, uh, maybe we can connect later if that's the case. So. So the first half of the presentation, like I said, motorcycle design is my game. Uh, that's what I do. It's 10 minutes presentation, so it will be mostly visual and a quick run of a lot of pictures. So uh, 2009 to 2018, I was with the TVS Motor Company. Uh, I got placed in CPDM uh, back in 2009. I was fortunate to have a great boss and a great team at uh, TVS. Uh, it was a lot of mentorship on their part to kind of refine me. And uh, some of the projects I thought uh, I'd uh, showcase here is like we I started with 100 CC, 125 CC motorcycles, and uh, projects like the Phoenix 125, which is not there in the Indian market now, but uh, in another form in the African markets as the HLX. I had worked on uh, uh, RTR platforms. We were very fortunate to exhibit the Draken concept, which is like the you know what RTR can be, the epitome of it. And then uh, from time to time, some interesting uh, racing projects used to come. And then uh, with the tie-up with BMW, uh, Motorrad, we had the opportunity to design a motorcycle for TVS itself. That was the RR310. And also before showing that, we kind of showed the concept of that, which is called Akula. And uh, uh, it's been about five, six years since I joined uh, Bajaj now. I work for Bajaj Motorcycles uh, in Pune. I am right now presenting from Pune and I've worked with the projects like the Platina, the Domina, and the latest project that's come out, that's the uh, world's first ground up CNG motorcycle called the Freedom. So this is some of my, uh, more or less my portfolio. My interest in motorcycle design is kind of a flux of two uh, different uh, things that I really like, uh, of course, I like motorcycles, but then uh, even before motorcycles, my interest was mostly in comics. The earliest memories that I have are uh, sitting in a lending library in Chennai with my brothers and, you know, tracing out Superman, Batman, monsters and Spider-Man and things like that. And slowly I kind of picked up uh, what paneling is, what uh, stance is, what, uh, you know, facial features. So I started creating my own characters and own stories and I was kind of... Uh, uh, liking that. Then when I came to know that there is something called motorcycle design or product design for that matter, where you can uh, literally sketch every day and uh, build what you want and they pay for you. And that kind of like uh, felt like a dream job. So it was kind of like a mixture of two of my uh, most like passions, right? So just a quick introduction about what happens in the motorcycle uh, build or a motorcycle design from start to scratch. This is kind of similar for uh, any automotive process per se, a car, a bike, or a 
two wheeler or a scooter or a cycle or anything it's kind of the similar thing and it's more or less something the first half is something that we do in our design schools also right we for any problem we start with the market research we try to understand the uh, market we build a brief which kind of uh, puts all the uh, boundaries then we go about ideating sketching and we build mock ups or 3d models or physical models then presentation right so i'll just quickly run through the uh, a little elaborate version of the same so the first half is a mock market research uh, nowadays there are a uh, lot of these interesting digital tools where um, uh, uh, you get to show your vehicle and you can track the eyes of people the customers who come to look at it and you can track their eyes where they are looking at the vehicle where the hot spots are which are the things that they talk about more or which are the things that they don't like about so you get a gamut of dots in your concept uh, maybe the design that you would like to do maybe the tank is what you uh, spent a lot of time but people are not even looking at that you know things like that so market research from a basic thing could be qualitative or quantitative you can go just sit at a place and observe people use the product or you can go uh, a bit more elaborate with the uh, more questioners and try to bring numbers to this uh, you know a brief then all that thing goes into something called a uh, design brief wherein the boundary of the project is established the correct pro problem statement is established you have the uh, keywords for your design you build a mood board so what i'm showing now is roughly part of the design presentation of the rr310 just for um, you know uh, setting a baseline so the some of the keywords here you see is the predator technical streamlined so these are the thing that the designers uh, will constantly keep using and they'll generate uh, sketches based on these sort of keywords then of course after the design brief is set the sketching phase starts you kind of ideate with a lot of things for the rr310 the core idea or the crux of the idea was a uh, you know a predator on top of the evolutionary chain something like a shark so shark was the key element so i kind of took elements of a shark and try to give a spin and on to the vehicle and wherever possible if a functionality and the sort of design inspiration comes together then beautiful forms kind of come so the inspiration was something like the shark if you look at a shark it's very uh, sharp as a silhouette but if you go to a fish market and actually look at a shark it's very smooth you know all the muscles are mild bumps very streamlined so that is the feel uh, wanted to give on to the bike and uh, the key concept that got selected was something like this uh, normally uh, you propose concepts and you generally uh, it's kind of a similar process in both the companies that i've worked you make side view sketches and uh, out of the list of sketches it's easier for uh, you know the management to kind of go through or select the concepts uh, you start doing details of uh, the vehicle also like in this case the front look of it uh, how do you get the you know the angry look with the, but not being literally comical kind of being giving that serious uh, you know i mean business look and uh, i kind of extrapolated a little bit of that bubble eyes or that uh, deep looking uh, inset eyes of a, a shark and kind of making into that and thankfully there was a technology called by led projectors that time it, the concept and the idea came together with some functionality so if you see sport bikes generally only one eyes will be uh, that's because normally low beam will be one and the high beam will be one but in this case low and high beam are there on both so it doesn't have a that uh, a uh, single eye it's always on on both things uh, other details like for example uh, the speedometer normally a predator has got a, a hunter a hunter has got a you know the hunter vision uh, things blur out and when you're going fast on a motorcycle everything blurs out you look uh, ahead so that is a kind of form of abstraction i wanted to do something of a vertical speedometer where the taco everything looks more towards the horizon so that's the idea for the vertical speedometer so like that lot of sketches will be there uh, you can go through my portfolio in behance or uh, instagram later uh, for a full uh, idea about what the project was then after all these sketches uh, the digital sculpting part starts where uh, the 3d of it in a digital space starts evolving Uh, uh normally there is a concept digital phase where uh, polygon modeling uh, like blender maya or even uh, sub d in alias is used sometimes designers themselves will uh, develop 3d models and also that phase of the digital sculpting kind of becomes the base for clay sculpting also previously uh, the tradition was like you create a, a side view sketch a one is to one side view sketch and you create a tape drawing of that 
and you kind of translate it onto a physical vehicle. But thanks to 3D model nowadays, you can kind of make quick volumes, check them how it looks and mill them and keep milling them till you kind of, uh, you know, happy with the form that you're getting. So this is somewhere half, uh, a kind of a, a clay model build that you're seeing here. It's completely milled. Uh, there are special machines for it. It's a, a special clay. Uh, we call it industrial clay where it's pliable to be worked. There are specialist people called uh, clay sculptors uh, with fine arts backgrounds who, who are uh, adept at, you know, uh, sculpting it to shape to the requirement of the sketch or the vision of the designer. Of course, then there are multiple uh, uh, ways to show up uh, um, either a physical mock-up or a digital mock-up. Uh, the clay buck kind of uh, either using some dynoc or some films on top and then you can paint it and show the clay mock-up or you can scan it and kind of take it to a digital realm and completely uh, rapid prototype it and paint it again and show it as a physical presentation vehicle. Or in some cases, go fully digital with VR and things like that. So this image is actually a, a 3D model with some uh, graphic put on top to kind of simulate that it's a real vehicle, but it kind of gives a picture, good picture for the uh, management to take a call or the marketing to take a call, right? Whether we're heading in the right direction or not. In the case of uh, RR Triton, we were, uh, there was a fortunate period where there was like, what will the market uh, react to such a vehicle? So it looks very, very far-fetched into the future. That time there were not that many sport bikes in the Indian market per se, let's say the Ninja 250 or the, uh, mm, there was the R15, the first gen, I think. So will something as radical work? So we got an opportunity in Auto Expo to show, not really show, but really show uh, the concept. We kind of, uh, the entire front half of the vehicle is the RR310, uh, but we showed it like in a proper, uh, as a race bike, you know, as a race machine. Like if it had to exist in the racetrack, how will it look? So it's kind of the same vehicle, but in a more uh, different way. So we got free feedback from uh, the expo. The feedback was very positive. It kind of motivated the entire team back in the R&D and the marketing team to kind of go ahead with the launch of the vehicle. And uh, now to the more important uh, question, at least from your side is what you can do. Um, um, uh, if if you want to, if whatever I said is something striking a, a chord within yourself, if maybe this is a career that you'd like to pursue, maybe automotive design or something like that, there are some things that you need to, uh, uh, it's kind of common for all the students that I generally say. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like the constant pursuing of uh, trying to up your skill. Just keep on sketching. Uh, there are platforms like the Instagram, Behance, you can upload, get feedback. You will find all the studio heads, the managers, the you will find almost from every company across the world on platforms like LinkedIn and Instagram. So getting feed, giving, uh, getting free feedback from them is quite uh, nice. It will kind of improve your trade also. So keep posting online. Uh, that's a great way of, um, and also some ex exercises like uh, take a brand and kind of if they made another variant of that particular brand, let's say, the next generation Pulsar or next generation Artia or the next generation uh, Panigale or things like that, you know, then how will it look like? Then put that spin, kind of show your design thing yes, like, and improve yes, on like. that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, of course, uh, uh, internship is must. So before you enter into an industry, I think it kind of gives you a glimpse about you catch up on a lot of lingos, you can understand uh, how the processes work. So try to score uh, internship now, particularly there are so many startups and uh, so many uh, companies in, within India itself, like you can apply for an internship and try to, you know, learn that uh, trade in your second year, maybe a six month or a one year, if it's your final year project, that's well and good. Uh, then build a portfolio. Uh, so I generally use an online platform where I just upload images and write some, uh, uh, that's good enough. It's called Carbon Made. You guys can check it out or even uh, Behance and things like that, where you can get feedback from people. Uh, I would say start as early as possible. Keep on improving your, uh, it's not uh, you start this month and finished off next month as the placements come. It's not that way. Uh, keep on adding uh, new, new exercises to your portfolio and keep building it over a period of two years that you're there and uh, it'll show later. Uh, uh, easier way is to, where do I start? That's the question most people like, how do I, uh, it's it's like, I don't know whether my work is good or something like that. So one way, like they say, right, uh, good people, uh, good artists copy, uh, great artists steal and uh, 
the even god level uh, artists probably make the other artist work or something like that so you can have some um, people who inspire you you can follow their uh, line of work and if you can kind of pick up some uh, skill or techniques from them uh, that will improve your uh, uh, work also so i would suggest that you have some people who you can you know emulate uh, who you can look out for trends right and last is like show up Uh, go to the automotive expos go to uh, participate in design competitions keep a view out on what's happening across in the industry uh, keep a eye out for the trends that are out there and uh, yeah hopefully these are the basics of uh, how you go about uh, if you want to get into the automotive uh, you know design industry so you can catch me in any of these platforms mostly instagram i'm not that active in linkedin and behance just for show the slides so catch me on instagram if you guys want so thank you thank you everyone that was wonderful again um, just a reminder to all the panelists that uh, you know this is intended to be short uh, for the reason but we want you to come back right so this is only an introduction and also the intent is to know you and your journey but for the content we'll get you back for longer sessions uh, so with that now we'll have our first uh, speaker who's just next to me uh so we are coming back to the offline in the sense that uh, local mode here and let me just share the slides uh, screen again and then i'll put up the slides so there's a few steps here so you just have to bear with me and then i put up these and we're still not done yet because i still have to introduce him uh so with me uh, it's, it's it's a pleasure to have uh, professor balaji rangarajan who is uh, uh the acting dean at uh, nid bangalore at the moment uh, he's got a very interesting uh, uh, career in terms of the experience starting from physics doing the bachelor's in physics and then going on to do uh, engineering i believe automobile engineering and then went to coventry uh, so he's got a track record of um, you know very interesting educational background but equally impressive is his uh, experience also um, so for last uh, 15 years or so or a bit longer has been with an id uh, 12 years earlier with uh, so i am not really reading through i just skim through so uh, i'll make some number mistakes here and there but you get the uh, sentiment right so he was at an id amdabad for a long time then he has joined nagi bangalore moved here uh, and uh, before that uh, he also taught at the faculty of industrial design uh, oh sorry at ITSM Mexico that's where he got, he got started with his uh, education uh, as an academic before that he was uh, a practitioner uh, across many uh, industries i'll probably not go there i'll uh, leave him to talk about his work and also please uh, yeah thank you dr vishal for the kind introduction and a wonderful evening to all of you professors panelists and dr vishal Congratulations, CPDM, for the 25th year of Sri Jubli, and also congratulations to all of you because you made it to CPDM. You know, I always believe that doing design is transformative because it just makes you go sort of really go after something, and especially when you do that, the master's level, it's even more valuable because no one is pushing you to do that. possibly after school you took up engineering or something of that sort by you know someone told you but once you finish your bachelor's and then you work for some time and then you take up to pursue your passion i think from my own personal experience i think i find that to be very very exciting because i finished my bachelor's in physics back in 1991 and uh, i was looking for sort of i think around that time engineering was the probably the go to option uh because my my two brothers already were engineers and expected to be engineer and then i figured that i was he had integrated phd and also mit madras where abdul kalam dr abdul kalam graduated from i also applied for a couple of colleges and luckily got through mit to pursue my engineering uh in automobile and then i joined bajaj through placement just like arun was mentioning i was remembering my own journey uh, so i got placed in bajaj auto in pune and then from uh, for 8 years i worked in bajaj in the r&d developing engines to stroke and four stroke pretty much 
all of those Kawasaki products I worked on uh, from KV100, 125 caliber, eliminator, and few other products. I worked on engineering side of it, but I was to interface with industrial design. And that's where my sort of uh, passion for design kind of started. So I also I was kicked about signs all the time, you know, and since I happened to be in Pune, I just sneaked into Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. I just checked out what people are doing. And then I applied for PST. I never made it because it was hardcore quantum physics and all of that. I never made it because by the time I finished my engineering, I'd forgotten physics, most of it. And then I had friends who are big time in Tamil movie industry now. They're sonographers. I used to be a photography buddy. We used to go around with SLR and then shoot you know, pictures all around Pune. So I set up my own dark room at home in my bathroom, one corner. I was pursuing photography also, apparently. So I was very confused, but one thing was very clear. I want to do something very creative. And around that point of time, we used to have Glenn Kerr. I don't know if you've heard about him. It's a British motorcycle designer from Coventry University. He visited the Bajaj. He was consulting for Pulsar and other things. I, I met him. His journey was very inspiring. And I looked at his marker and pastel sketch and all of that. I said, oh, this is very interesting. But by the time I made up my mind to do transportation design, because it was a very natural choice for me to go into industrial design and not to sort of go into visual communication. Though I was very interested in visual communication, but you also try to balance, you know, where you would be, whether it would be okay for working in the film industry or something. But instantly, I also appeared for IDC in 95. Because around that time, IDC was taking people who had gate score also. So I had all India 17th rank in my gate score, which I never used. So when I heard about SEED, so I applied. Without SEED, I just went for an interview. They asked me industrial design. I said, no, visual communication. So they said, I think you're working in Bajaj. I think you should do industrial design. I said, no, thanks. So there was a moment of some sort of a realization that possibly I should continue to work and then until I find my real passion, I should continue to work, not to take a decision like, uh, you know, in a haste. So that's what led me to Coventry University. And I did my uh, specialization in automotive design. I came back to India and worked for three years in Tata Motors design, from sketch to nearly production on the Tata Nano. And then I left for US. I worked in a, a startup called Revolution Motors uh, in California, Santa Barbara. And then from there, I moved to Mexico. I went to teach for three months. I ended up staying for three years to teach. And I never looked back, in fact, because around that time, I also came to NID on summer vacation. I mean, came to India for summer vacation. I went and taught in NID. And in 2011, I joined transportation design as a full-time uh, designer, uh, design faculty. And from then on, I've been with NID to, since 2011. 21, I moved to Bangalore campus to head the Universal Design program. Very interesting program because if I talk about my own journey, I think from someone who is very passionate about just sketching, I think it has gone to a level that probably design is not just about just sketching and it, it's not just something that meets the eye. It's, it's very profound. And in that context, I, I think I take some freedom to take you through some of those things that I feel really valuable for design aspirants. With uh, your permission, please. Yeah. It is only really open. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So in universal design, we look at design for all. Right? It doesn't just start with something tangible, intangible, and uh, it's not just about disability or something, but it's something that cuts across generations and gender and everything. And very interesting program. And all the five programs here, I don't know if you have come to an NID campus before, uh, we have five programs. Universal design, which I am part of. We also have digital game design. And Vivek might be interested. Probably he has some interaction with the uh, uh, NID students before as a part of his startup, maybe. And we also have interaction design, which is a big thing now, and information design. 
and also designed for retail experience. These are the five programs that we have here. Feel free to visit us anytime. And uh, so I predominantly work on uh, representation techniques and form, especially automotive and also industrial design in general, and also smart technology and applications and systems thinking and design projects where absolutely fun to work with the students where they come up with lots and lots of interesting ideas and then sort of try to get them through you know, the ideation process and everything. So in that context, I think I'm just going to very quickly take you through design, rather how do you approach design if it is valuable for you? Because I, I saw some people from first year also, I think maybe it's my take on design, how you approach design. Is it just about aesthetics or something beyond? Or where do you even start? Yeah, okay, I'll take about five minutes. Is it okay? Yeah, okay, right. I thought this is sort of uh, very relevant because I didn't know. I, I was shared the format, but I thought instead of just stopping with what I did, uh, probably a few nuggets of uh, what could be useful for the design aspect. And so I thought, okay, right. Any guess on what this could possibly be? Right. It's an art. Yeah, absolutely it is an art. Anything else that comes to mind? It's very abstract, I know. Yeah. Topography? Okay. Any other guesses? Top three guesses. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You, you sort of nailed it. So how big this could be, if you could imagine? A droplet. OK. So if I have to give a scale of this, this is one of the five massive rubbish patches floating around. Okay, if I have to give you some idea of how big this is, that's how big it is. It's a nice painting. You have done, you have contributed big time into this through all the plastics because we almost like we we sort of use billions of billion pounds of plastics every year, and only ten percent of that sort of mix into the ocean. And some of them settle down, some of them float. And this is something that floats, is a thick muck of plastic, which is sort of trying to get sort of the sunlight kind of breaks that up, breaks it down, but it never sort of does that, right? It just keeps floating. And there are a lot of initiatives to clean the ocean plastics now that I've come across. And uh, in that context, I think why this is important for designers. Right, not just as consumers, or users of you know products and everyday objects and everything, but as designers, I think we 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 shoulder a huge responsibility when when we create because if you have a starting point, you can always convince people down the line in the process to say, oh, try this material. So in that context, I think being a designer is it's not only sort of a, a nice thing. You know, to be, but also it's a very challenging, very demanding thing. Okay. Well, I'm not going to the details of that. You know, all those pinks and greens and everything is about how big they are and then, you know, what it is made of and everything. All the majority of that comes from that plastic cap, right? And I'm sure you know this. Yeah. It's a very, very, very simple ritual in the morning. People do on the doorstep. And what is the significance of that? If you, if you, some of you could, any one of you could get that across. Where do they do that? Exactly. So this is something that I've seen in most of the doorsteps. It houses the morning wake up and then they do this. It's called kolam, it's called rangoli in different cultures. And why this is important is it is not just something as precious to sort of you know, make something and then leave it at the point. Uh, it's made of the rice powder, which becomes a bird and and feed. And this 
it's pretty similar to what I just showed. It's also art, but it's it's very profound and very significant in the Indian context, especially because I believe that anything I need Arun's take on this because he said he's doing some research on uh, Indian history, right? I I dig out a lot of things around the ancient way of living, and it's so profound. Not just this, lot of, so many things that we have started calling superstitious are actually very very scientific and very empathetic in nature. Okay, talking about that, I think there's a there's a huge sense of harmony and empathy in our lifestyle, which is slowly becoming possibly because of well, lifestyle. I think it's getting sort of washed away. So in that context, I think designers, we have a great challenge. As I said, I came across this uh, uh, making by Nike, where they look at, uh, it was a collaboration project with students, of course, of one of the institutes, where could you select a material based on the chemistry and amount of water consumption and everything? And could you be sensible in making a choice for material? It's just about that. It's a beautiful application. You, you click on something and it will give you all the data. It's a very uh, well-researched project that I came across. And in that context, I think I started realizing possibly we don't seek enough in nature. When you want to design, we just look at, you know, pretty much in terms of what the user needs and, you know, how should it look like and all of that. But possibly, even if we spend a little time in how things work around us, not made by us. But I think there's a huge inspiration. I follow nature and I've not published any paper. I've not done anything, but I'm so intrigued to read books and then understand. I've been reading these books and it just got me thinking you know, I think design is something we really celebrate, but with nature, it is just a everywhere. For example, have you heard of a four-eyed fish? A four-eyed fish? What it does is it hunts above and below the water. I, I don't know if I'm taking well, away too, more, too much time, but very quickly I'll just come to the point. So it's very important for design. So what it does is it hunts above and below water, and always the middle tissue of the eyes, it aligns with the water. And the story doesn't end there. It has developed, evolved a beautiful flap like a visor. You know why? So that when the direct sunlight hits the water and then it could actually prevent, you know, the, the reflection affecting their hunting. So like that, I have 100 examples I can tell you, but on a later occasion, okay? So I think nature is the best place to learn and probably apply design from. And this is slightly longer, but I'll just cut, cut it short without asking you a question. So what could possibly be the connection between those bunch of flowers and possibly those salmon floating around? So, yeah. Okay, I'll track it for you. This is, this is a part of an ecosystem, right? To cut it short for the positive time, it may not be very evident when you look at it. Right? Maybe some fish, water, and then this. So when I read through this, I follow this, uh, uh, something called, uh, like a deep look. Just check it out on YouTube. There's a beautiful channel which just absolutely just blows your mind. Okay? And what? What's the beauty of this? The salmon, they were born in the river stream, just closer to the forest. They go all the way into the ocean, and they come back to die. Reproduce and die. Those salmons are eaten by the grizzly bears and they're not eaten fully. So, to cut the long story short, these leftover ones they provide the nitrogen for the entire forest because the forest have huge soil erosion. All the nitrogen that is eroded through soil are brought back by the salmons. So, it is a beautiful ecosystem that we should study. We should study rather to understand, and it could be a huge you know, value for doing design. So it goes like that, you know, those maggots, the blue fly, they feed on them and uh, they, they go underground. They also nurture the soil, but the pollination happens to those blue flies. That's a flyer connection. And eventually the connection is so well established that it is an ecosystem, right? So in that context, how do we look at our man-made ecosystem? 
So I looked at this uh, beautiful illustration from 1925 scientific American or popular science, I believe, right? So this is 1925, yeah, August. 100 years is now, yeah. So one of the architects said, this is how we might live in 50s. So I don't have to tell you because we live in Bangalore. I don't have to explain anything, you know, into this, you know. So they devised a beautiful layering system of slow moving traffic, fast moving traffic, and then how you, you don't have to carry your own luggage. The flight tube could take care of that. If something goes wrong, you could have the garage to get things prepared and all of that. So I think beautiful illustration to look at and then get back to a system level thinking, which we have been discussing because when Dr. Vishal came to our campus, we were talking about the systems thinking. I think there's a huge opportunity for designers to look at not just products. You don't start with the product. You can start with the product, but the implications, the causal loops, if you understand them, your design will become profound. Nobody can even touch it. Right, you'll be very solid in that context. Okay, so I wouldn't go detail in, into this. So some of the students and uh, myself traveled to University of Cincinnati to present uh, our systems thinking course, which is mentored by our director, current director, and twenty-seven universities participated. They got the first prize because the amount of research that that has gone into this to understand how the farmers are the backbone of the country and how the entire system works. Eventually, they, they, they produced beautiful solutions, how you know we have very small gullies in the Mandi to take the final crop to, but from the paddy field or whatever, and how the system is not allowing us to do that. So it devised a beautiful transportation system around that. Maybe another occasion I'll touch upon this. But very quickly, getting into you know, so recent systems thinking where climate change and migration, how they're interconnected. One of the students from University of developed a tool for policymakers to sort of, for example, if I want to build a smart city, what parameters would I look into to design? Whether it's water, whether it is, uh, you know, the infra, what kind of infra and all of that. There is a beautiful interactive thing that Splash developed. Very quickly, I think many times we get lost when we when we get a product design, asking what is the function and what is the form. But what if if I told you that this piece of jewelry is, is absolutely not precious. There's no gold, there's no silver, there's no solitaire, but it sells. What could be the reason for this? Any guess? That's a lowly laser cut pendant. Yeah, that's what you see. It could be dangerous also to move around with this, right? But this startup called Meshu, what they did was, if I want to order some, something to somebody, right, as a gift, I just log in and then get wherever they went to, probably on a backpacking or whatever. It connects all those dots and then makes a beautiful sort of a product design. So what sells these days? I'm not telling you that you should follow this route, but what could also make your product design and your ideas click could be possibly it's not just the product and the material or whatever that is, but it could possibly be the narrative behind it, right? Another one very close. There's a lot of fast fashion now, right? People jump things very quickly, but this I found very interesting. Something called abstract underscore, again, a clothing company. What they did was, I think this is way ahead, in fact. You know, this was like almost like 10 years ago or 12 years ago. They use AI. What it does is, you simply log on to abstract underscore. What it does is you sort of type a story of your own. Maybe you joining in CPDM. Then it actually builds an algorithm with your pupil dilation and your eyebrow movements and all the keyboard passes and everything. It generates beautiful patterns, which directly is fed into the machine and directly all the garments are created right away. So you wouldn't find anyone else wearing something very similar because there's a very strong emotional connect to that. So there's a way you could actually bring in design in a sustainable way, still using technology, right? Technology is being sort of now 
uh, seen on the other side. But I think if you put technology in the right place, I think it could just do wonders, right? That's a that's a story behind this, right? And this this won an interaction design award in uh, 2016, right? And I'll just finish it very quickly. Yeah, sorry about that. And also one of the student projects which touched upon the same emotion to build an automobile. Automobile, and also this is, I think, for designers we have to really imagine a lot. As Einstein said, logic could take you from point A to point B. Yeah, imagination could take you everywhere. So going by that, I think this is one of the beautiful transportation design I came across by Pastman Good. Uh, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So Pastman Good uh, in UK, so they developed a future transportation. They said all the transportation that we have now are outdated, right? And they said, could we have a very fast non-stop intercontinental train that never stops but all the city movement could be taken into that particular train that never stops by docking them in that high speed right these are phenomenal in terms of thinking you might say oh no that doesn't look like a feasible option but look at it science fiction is just a matter of time jetpacks going to probably moon uh, just launching a rocket and then having it reused all of that, people never even sort of thought about it, but it's a reality now. So as designers, we have a lot of freedom to imagine, right? So I think with that, I would just, uh, some of the student work I want to share with the passage of time, I'll just skip this because this is from, from my course, which I offer as advanced representation techniques where spectral design. This is a future of motorsport where AI helps in learning circuits and uh, one of the veteran, maybe Michael Schumacher or someone transfers all the data onto that machine and then it gets transferred to the mobile you know, races and then we sort of race and then machine and man learn from each other and feed each other. That is it. You know, it's another interesting project how material could be a starting point, which is, uh, I got this project for Freni, he did how could be the future of transportation or tourism in Mars where it is done by mycelium. You grow mycelium on Mars and build automobiles, right? I just cut short at that point. But I think pretty much I just reached the end of the presentation. And I think design is all about heart and head. I'm not telling this as a new thing. You already know it. But if you add a great skill to it, I think it is a fantastic recipe. Okay? And uh, I wish you all the best. I covered these things. Look at the big picture. Do stories. And go out of the box, imagine, be balanced, and also have a lot of empathy for design. Okay, so I'll leave it here. This is some of my work. I don't know if I have to show it here because just like you, when I went to Coventry, I was challenged with, you know, how do I even make automotive form? So my final project was about Fiat. And I asked this question. You cannot start. It's a great way to actually do design is ask questions. So our design projects do not start with, okay, can I do this brand? So I have to ask a question. So my research question was, can looking backwards be forward thinking? So I looked at this nostalgic revival of multiple car brands and everything like Mustang to Mini to all of that. And I looked at Fiat, which was going down. I used a leveraged on Ferrari as a, you know, as a sub brand. And I created this, you know, sketches, clay models, cast and resin, finish them, cut the lights, and do a final model, which is one is to five. This is my final product, which went on the exhibition in the British Transport Museum. And uh, so 10 weeks project from sketch to the final model. And this is all in resin and painted, basically. And uh, that's what my project in my final year, which is a blast. I learned so much in 10 weeks and anything probably later. But pretty much, I think you know some of my work. I don't know if I have time to touch upon, but uh, that's about it. This was my work in California, which I was working on a leaning trike. I'll stop there. I think uh, universal design for the people who are visually impaired and people who cannot speak, you go to a doctor, they don't know what to explain because you can't speak. So could there be an application to sort of directly interconnect the patient and the doctor so that they could touch and then say, oh, this is what the ailment is. And then they prescribe, it goes into the medical records and everything. So some of the children oriented design everything. Sorry for taking more time. I'm absolutely sort of uh, excited to be here and all the best to you. And thanks to the panelists for the patience. Wonderful. Thank you very much.
but uh, okay, so I still have to need the mic because I have to, uh, I mean, of course, you are the next one speaking, but I have to introduce you, right? So um, uh, with that wonderful talk again, uh, uh, we have the next panelist. And as you can see, we have a lot of diversity uh, in the panelists and their design experiences. So again, going along with that, uh, we have uh, Pranay Sabarwal, uh, who is a graduate from MIF New Delhi, brings over 23 years of ex expertise in design, category management, and marketing within India's retail sector. Known for his deep understanding of fashion retail, he has successfully collaborated with international brands, customizing strategies for the Indian market. At Visual uh, Noise, produc uh, Visual Noise Productions, uh, Pranay directs advertisements and produces uh, campaigns for lifestyle brands. His creative vision and strategic approach result in engaging campaigns that enhance brand visibility and drive consumer loyalty. So with that... Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um... First of all, uh, thanks for getting me here. I think uh, one, I'm very excited about it because it's not my alma mater, but my father's alma mater, you know, so he's been, yeah, so uh, back in 1980, I think I was born in this campus, somewhere here in and around. So uh, first of all, uh, what do I do? Uh, I graduated from NIFT. I mean, after all the three uh, uh, panelists, I think I... Um, I feel like I'm, I'm the least uh, studied over here. <laughs> you know, first uh, 2001, I didn't study. I think uh, all of you are doing uh, your uh, uh, masters in uh, design. Uh, I think I left it immediately after graduation. Not even graduation because NIFT didn't even give a graduation; they just gave a diploma. So, so um, uh, I mean, but then again, so. Uh, I started my uh, work in the industry as a designer with uh, in the brass uh, sector in Muradabad. That is uh, when we used to design for all these brands like Targets, uh, Marvins, your uh, pottery barns and all. Exciting. But I didn't want to stay in Muradabad. But it happened here. So that's what uh, pulled me into, uh, into fashion in Bangalore. And it just stuck around. So, uh, I mean, cutting it short, uh, I mean, moved in from Levi's, uh, from Levi's into into handbags, handbags into uh, into luggage with uh, Reliance Retail. I was like, this is it. I think I, I need to start something on my own because I'm getting bored too often. And which is, I think, a very good decision because. Uh, the day I started on my own, I think every different every day was a different project, you know. So I, I think um, philosophy number one: keep getting bored, you'll keep getting exciting projects, you know. Because the more you uh, uh, move around, the more uh, you keep on getting charged about uh, different kinds of uh, uh, things around. Uh, now, what do I do? I think after about. Uh, 10 further years, I was like, Ye to ho gaya. I think at the end of the day, the the basis of uh, all design lies about, lies in storytelling. So let's figure out a way to do storytelling. So that's how I moved from uh, fashion into visual design, uh, into uh, retail design, uh, into a very interesting uh, medium called, the adver uh, called advertising and uh filmmaking so that's that's how i moved into uh making ads for brands and that is precisely what i do we i write scripts i direct ads um i've got a team who produces the entire content and we work with brands like vip we work with brands like levi's uh we work with uh entire madura group which is the other tabula fashion and retail so all in all i, I think uh, one of the Things which has really kept me uh, very excited about this entire thing is uh, your the uh, the process will more or less remain the same. The tools will keep on getting added. Yeah, it's a great tool. If the everybody is looking at it. There is a there is a great way to just keep on uh, uh, leveraging it. You know, back in the day. Uh, so when you, when it comes to space design, uh, you'll have uh, you'll have technologies which have not been heard of. 
go explore them you know at the end of the day you just keep on exploring keep on uh, trusting in the entire process of design you know because uh, what happens is the we as designers tend to uh, overshoot the entire process and just kind of forget where the uh, where the basis of uh, design has has really come in from you know it's it's good to uh, jump up to the final uh, so if, if we have to design this particular space uh, rather than i mean we'd have some sort of an idea ki mere ko karna kya hai isme you know rather than asking a question in terms of what is really the way uh, uh, Ms. Bala said that we don't ask uh, questions enough to ourselves, you know, that, I mean, at times the entire answer lies in how well you frame a particular question, you know. So um, I think we as designers uh, need to have an impact in terms of uh, what are we delivering to the society, you know, whether we... We're making a film, whether we're making an ad, whether we're making a product, or we're making a bike, the way uh, Arun did. You know, at the end of the day, uh, there is a social responsibility towards whatever we do, and which is exactly uh, uh, what I come to, that trust the process, work towards, uh, uh, I mean, to be very, very challenging towards yourself. I mean, don't, don't cut short anything in between it's it's a great uh, you guys are in a great profession uh, it's it's very very hard to keep on uh, working towards uh, working and thinking design something which is a very very simple solution you know so i think you just just enjoy enjoy it all together so uh, yeah i think i'll come to more of it uh, in, in the further slides uh, and then the further part of the presentation. And I think I'm just going to leave it at that itself for now. Sure. Right, so uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll change the format a bit uh, in the uh, interest of time, not in, really in the interest of time, but also I've noticed that, you know, while we keep the discussion here, the alumni starts to drop off. Uh, while I'll still ask them to hold on for two, three minutes, we'll take some questions. And then I'll hold on to the uh, panel discussion part. Then we'll ask our alumni who are online, uh, the previous batch, to introduce themselves. So we'll, we'll take two to three questions at the moment because that's still, the discussions are still fresh. So questions. Raise your hands. Uh, somebody will bring the mic to you. Nobody has questions. We discussed that you should have questions and nobody has questions. And if, if you have a question to a specific panel, you should say, otherwise, yeah. Okay. Well, as you were uh, talking uh, in design, so when you were talking, you brought into it that you have put it in your presentation. Uh, what do you think of uh, the probabilities of the vertical docking versus horizontal docking, which you would think would be uh, faster in the future? Or do you expect personal docking Vehicles right on the uh, household terraces uh, in the whole system. Where do you see the future transport? It's an interesting question, actually. In fact, <clears throat> I think you are referring to that uh, the futuristic representation. Uh, I feel it is very near. We are not into the future. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, we're not. We were much over, you know, so many decades, actually. <clears throat> I think in terms of transportation, we we are driven by the infrastructure that we have. The way we build our houses, the way we build our offices, all of that probably determine what kind of uh, vehicles you'll have. And it it takes an enormous amount of uh, sort of effort and thinking to change the transportation system. For example, I know because every time I just go from here, I just live few blocks away from here in Maleshwaram. So I could reach Gorgunta Palaya in like less than five minutes. But from there to my NID campus, it will take another like 30 minutes or 20 minutes, depending on the traffic. So there, I mean, no matter whether you have like a, a performance vehicle or whatever that is, you are slowed down or something like that. But coming back to your question of how do we see the future of transportation, 
I remember this Minority Report. There's a movie which you have watched possibly where Tom Cruise comes and docks the entire, you know, thing uh, vertically, just scales vertically and then docks directly into probably hundredth floor onto his balcony and then walks in and then switches on a holographic image and all of that. So that that could become a possibility because if I look at there's a lot of vertical, um, you know, takeoff machines being put into uh, mainstream transportation now for business and all of that. I think is it very exponential, in fact, you know, in terms of it's not like a linear, it will take forever to reach that point, but rather our expansion or development is like very short time, but a humongous improvement that we are seeing in transportation, in fact. So in that particular context, I think it's not far. I hope I answered your Right. Uh, one question more before I. Yep. Oh, now we have multiple hands. Okay. We'll go right at the. Yeah, it's one to one connection. You see, we are looking at straight at each other. Uh, my question is from uh, to Balaji sir. So you have worked in automotive industry. So uh, as we talk about uh, designing a vehicle, so um, aesthetic plays a very important part in that. So. Uh, Many times we take inspiration from nature, uh, like we saw in uh, Arun's, Arun sir's presentation also. He took uh, inspiration from shark. He wants to design agile and uh, streamlined uh, bike. So uh, when we are done with the concept, how do we assess the aesthetics of the outcome? It's a great question. Uh, so there are two ways you could approach design in terms of looking at nature for, you know, uh, inspiration, basically. One is purely form centric. And the second one is possibly how you sort of integrate the function also. Right. So looking at nature, it is not just about aesthetics. If you just dig a little deeper, you could bring in so much into design. I'll give you two examples. Uh, I can share the link also. One of the Interior motives, which is part of the car design news, they used to run a competition every year. And one of the entries that I've seen is, I think a lot of people get inspired from flowers and buds and all of that. One of the entries which won the competition was, it was called Blossom or something like that. And the, the entire semantics of it or the entire form is inspired by the bud, flower bud. Okay, so naturally you get the streamlining of the car. First of all, right? And how the door opens is not like a sort of a normal door opening of a car. So the entire petal, if it opens, like a sister door, and also all the interior, everything is, I think I should show the picture and talk about it, but rather I don't have it now. But it is not just the aesthetics, but rather you also think about how those semantics or how things work. If you bring that, into your design also, it won't be like a surface. You're not just saying it as, oh, this is inspired from something like a cheetah or something, but rather you are getting into one step sort of down to understand how things work in nature, and that makes it substantial. Since we're talking about the nature, I came across, do you know how the jellyfish, if it loses one tentacle, how do they manage to stay afloat? The jellyfish, it's got a lot of tentacles. Deep sea, they keep floating. It's very stable. When they lose one of the tentacles, what do they do? They have no bone, nothing. They're very squishy. They're very slimy. They don't regrow the tentacle. They just squish like that, and then they rearrange the tentacle to equal angle so that they could stay afloat. This blew my mind. And I was thinking, what happens when you... When you design something around this concept, just conceptually, I'm saying. So when you inspire from nature, it is not just about the form. It's also about something deeper, maybe function, something around the system, maybe whatever that could be. That will be hugely uh, effective, in my opinion. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Right. I'm sure you're aware of the Idea Inspired project, which started something like 20 years ago or longer. If you are not, then no, no. It's so the go to ideas lab check, check the ideas inspired project, right? So it's it's all about uh, 
biomimetics and learning from nature and so on. So we'll take one more question. I have to be biased because we have one faculty question as well. So no, 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 that's okay. I mean, they have asked two questions. We'll take one other question. No, I think he's bringing it, he's bringing it. Yeah. Keep it short and we'll look for a short answer as well. Yeah, the, the question is about uh, the tools, uh, what uh, for the uh, CAD or management of the production, movie production. So well, there are, before, just hold on, let me check whether Vivek has just gone for a coffee or is still there. Vivek, are you still there? This is coming off the screen. Yes, oh, there. yeah, good. Well, yeah, so my question is uh, Vivek and Arun also. So Arun also talked about Blender in the industry. So there are open source tools also. So how the industry actually use the open source tool and how the proprietorship tools are also play interplay between them, how both of them can be better leveraged for the students here. So how we will be guiding them to go for the professional proprietorship tools or the open source tools? Because industries nowadays also go for open source tools, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you answered uh, it yourself, which is, uh, yeah, everyone is going for open source right now. And uh, even, uh, so there's a, there's a computer graphics conference called SIGGRAPH. I was actually attending that a uh, couple of weeks ago. And even in SIGGRAPH, uh, that's been the biggest motive, like a lot of open source is coming up. And uh, with, with open source engines, innovation is faster and also pipelines are faster. And also like uh, usually usually what the traditional workflow for like let's say studios or big studios in Hollywood was uh, everyone was building proprietary tools like let's say Sony Pictures or you know uh, big VFX companies. But with Blender, uh, yeah, it has changed the game. Like everyone has control on the source code. With source code, what happens is uh, you can integrate and make plugins faster. Uh, and plugins have been the game changer, especially now with the AI race and everything, like a lot of things are available in GitHub and a lot of researchers are open sourcing their code as well. So you can you can write like very fast plugins uh, for Blender and, you know, super accelerate your process. So, yeah, that's been the that's been the game where also everyone is in actually right now. Right. So that was the developer's answer. Now, I don't uh, a designer's answer was user of the tool. Yeah. Uh, so Blender is the hot thing out there. Uh, it's made it more, you know, democratized. Everybody can. It's it's not a paid software, so uh, um, people can use and they can add value to it by adding their own, uh, you know, tidbits to it. So it made it made, it's made it more democratized. Like I see students, like uh, you know, across uh, trying to build stuff, and there's so many online tools that are available. How to build things, and it makes it gives it a very polished, uh, you know, output and everything like that. So I think Blender's uh, game changes because it's free and it's kind of like, it's kind of everybody's tool now, you know. <laughs> I'll just right. add on right. to uh, yeah. the earlier question, if I may. Uh, I think uh, he asked about uh, how do you uh, get inspiration from nature and how do you evaluate it, right? right. Uh, something right. like that. So that yeah. is the insecurity that uh, uh, almost everybody, even I, uh, after designing, uh, whether it's good or not. So that's a question that's always at the back of your mind. Like, is it, is it like I thought of uh, this thing and I made it. I thought of the, maybe uh, the clouds and that's an inspiration and I made this, but is it really good? So your gut feeling, is, you're, the first thing is your gut feeling, right? If you're not interested about it, and most probably others might not be. So passing that, I think getting uh, feedback uh, is the easiest way to see, to check. Uh, feedback could be your closest friends or feedback could be the prospective clients or customers. That's the only way out. Otherwise, you, as designers, you will have blind spots. You will never know whether it's good or not. So reaching out is the way. Right, thank you. Any design is a hypothesis to be tested by the market, right? All right, so with that, uh, thanks a lot. I think, um, uh, and again, all of these people, uh, of course, Arun is in Pune, but we'll ask him to come sometime for longer sessions. Uh, Vivek will be back. Uh, he's based in Bangalore, so we'll again have also, I mean, they are still not going, so I'm just, you know, every now and then reminding you that, you know, these are people who are available for longer sessions as well. Uh, but before that, before we move into the panel discussion part of it, uh, I'll request all the uh, 20th batch people to please uh, come on screen uh, so that we can see you. And uh, now I have a difficult task. Uh, okay, I, I, I don't see your name separately. Or let me try doing that.
which in which order would you like to go about? So I'll leave it to you. Maybe in alphabetical order, you know each other. So you know the alphabetical order as well in your batch. Uh, so please come on screen, tell us where you are, what has been your journey so far, and uh, we'd love to hear. So I, who starts? Agnivesh. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yes. please go ahead. Yes. Yes. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Agnivesh. Uh, I was basically an industrial engineer before uh, doing the MDES. So after MDES, uh, I was campus placement, got into Mahindra and Mahindra. So initially, two years I was into advanced technology. So we were kind of acting as a uh, consultant to the automotive farm powertrain division. So we were kind of solving the problem which they were not solving, obviously because of lack of time. So we were basically involved in filing patents and uh, writing research papers and all. So uh, due to that work culture, I got two or three patents. Two patents, uh, one is already I have granted, one is in the process. So in the later years of Mahindra, due to the organizational structure change, I went into ergonomics and I was basically doing uh, digital human modelings for the open station and cabin tractors in the US market. So currently the Mahindra Oja platform, which is there, uh, I worked on uh, uh, the two, uh, two segment, uh, 20, uh, 20 HP to 30 HP. So two platform I worked, both for open station and cabin. And uh, currently I am working in uh, a public sector organization, National Mineral Development Corporation. So as an assistant manager in the, in the industrial engineering and management services department, uh, it is under Ministry of Steel, and uh, currently I am based in uh, Madhya Pradesh, near Khajuraho. So uh, it's more of a managerial job. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Right, great to see you. Uh, all right, thanks for introducing yourself and good to hear your journey. Uh, next is Devil. You should have been here, Devil, in person. Are you there? Okay, we'll park aside for a moment. We'll count to three. One, two, and three. That was a quick three. All right, so we'll come to Rahul. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello, AC sir. Hello, DS sir. Hello, Vishal sir. Hello, all, everyone, every faculties. My humble pranam to one and all. So, uh, yeah, yeah, after we graduated, um, I was, uh, my journey has been quite uh, more more to, to, towards the academia only. So I have been um, uh, assistant professor at the PES University, uh, teaching uh, and mentoring B-Design students there in Bangalore, where I have been around four, four and a half years. And after that, since I was uh, inclined to research, uh, I then moved uh, into uh, here in Italy in Alps. Um, presently, I'm in the Free University of Bolzano, where I'm pursuing my PhD in um, human computer interaction. So, uh, more precisely, I'm working in um, uh, smart textile interfaces for automotive interiors, where uh, I'm working in collaboration with uh, the BMW where we are uh, uh, looking at uh, interfaces which uh, are not, which are beyond, uh, you know, the, the regular touchscreen or glass-based interfaces. So we are looking at interfaces which are more like, which are soft in nature, like uh, non-variable textile-based interfaces where you can sort of, you know, touch, press, and, you know, you can do many other gestures on the surface which can be sort of recognized and utilized to sort of uh, trigger any functionalities inside the automotive interior space. So, uh, yes, uh, that's how my presently the journey is sort of uh, turning on. And uh, let's see where the, it takes uh, in the future. Yeah, wonderful. So, so he was here last month. Uh, so you went back uh, more recently, right again. So. So hopefully when you visit yeah, again, do drop by. And again, we can have a presentation from you for a longer session. Yeah, sure, sure. Right, the next Sanket. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, please go ahead. 
Uh, good evening, sir, uh, professors, uh, Amresh and Dibakar Sen. I think I only know three of you here, <laughs> and also next uh, the rest of the batch. Um, yeah, I'm actually uh, right now in Whitefield, Bangalore. I couldn't come to the campus. I always wanted to, uh, but I think I couldn't leave early for office. Uh, so yeah, attending online. Uh, I work as a UX designer um, in digital space. It's been like five years or maybe more than that. Um, working at SAP Labs right now in ERP industry. Not so fancy. It's very boring. The application don't look so good. Uh, but yeah, I'm the UX designer here. Um, uh, so I think, uh, yeah, my focus was never always UX or something of that sort, mostly into IoT space. I think that's what I have done. Uh, worked in uh, CPDM, uh, but later that I wanted to also pursue the same into entrepreneurship, but couldn't do because of health issues, but ended up in US design right now. Uh, but still, I'm slightly skeptical about this uh, market industry. I mean, the way the jobs are going, people are mostly getting into user experience or maybe the very fancy design space. Uh, and rather, I'm looking at the way I think we were taught uh, especially by why I'm talking about this, generally I don't. Uh, but I think I feel very homely when I'm at a CPDM. So yeah, I'm looking forward mostly getting into product management more than design space, what industry talks about. And yeah, that's been this uh, all the time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Good to hear again. Uh, so of course I made a mistake there in terms of the order, alphabetical order. Manavendra is there, so Manavendra. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, hello, professors. So it's nice seeing everybody again. And uh, yeah, so, and uh, hello, everyone. This is Manvinder Singh. Um, so about my journey, I'll say uh, I actually was working as an architect before I joined. CPDM and mostly towards the smart architecture and uh, um, incorporating technology into the architecture. So when I moved to the design, my primary focus primarily was to um, get to know more ways how we can in incorporate technology into uh, um, industry where uh, they are most reluctant to make any update. Uh, so, like um, after my um, post graduation in CPDM, uh, I, along with uh, uh, Dada, I'll say Bham Rahul Bhamik, uh, we uh, joined the PS University. And uh, over there, I taught as uh, the assistant professor for two years. Uh, from there, uh, I made the switch to UX domain uh, in a tech company in Singapore. So that was catering the Southeast Asian market. So with the experience uh, yeah. in education, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that was a good uh, area to start my UX journey. Uh, from there, I shifted back again to the real estate domain, but into the real estate technology. So I joined the nobroker.com where uh, they were expanding their uh, business to Middle Eastern countries. So in, in no broker, there is a a product which is called No Broker Hood, which is a society management uh, platform. So uh, I worked in ERP and also um, in incorporating IoT technologies in that. So um, we ultimately incorporated lots of uh, user access management uh, IoT uh, gizmos into the uh, digital ecosystem. And uh, uh, because, like by incorporating that, we were also able to um, uh, convince Google to collaborate with us and expanded our uh, reach to multiple uh, Middle Eastern countries. From there, I again made a switch uh, in another uh, company. Currently, I'm working in Magic Vix, uh, which is uh, under Times Internet. Uh, right now, I'm in Noida, UP. Uh, as the lead UX designer. So over here, uh, um, like again, uh, in the real estate domain only, but uh, not in the construction, but more in real estate business. So there are agents, there are builders who are still using the rudimentary 
technologies for very high net worth domain uh, where uh, we are making some um, systems which can ease the uh, real estate uh, dealings and management so yeah so currently i have developed uh, two independent products in magic bricks uh, in the span of last one year uh, and going commercially as well so yeah so, uh, from an architect to uh, a ux designer who is working in real estate domain that's that was my whole journey wonderful so every every story is different and that's the beauty of it uh, so with that uh, again hope as uh, they will there okay you are out of office no problem oh devil is there i think is hello yes hello you need to come on camera as well right so just a moment uh, actually i was not aware i will be called to speak <laughs> right just a moment am i am i visible now yes yes please go ahead hello we have the avatar of all the inside yeah. i see two devils right that's the uh, ai this thing oh, okay, calls yeah yeah please go ahead sorry i i i was uh, i mean this was unanticipated but nevertheless uh, so i've had a little bit of a different journey since completing my work uh, during the mdsc period i have actually stayed back maybe longer than i would have initially wanted but i think i'm in 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 at this point at least i'm doing what i would what i initially hoped to do which is to run my uh, startup in the medical device space so we are working on an affordable insulin pump which was also my major project back then and uh, we are trying to commercialize that now um, we are fortunately quite close to that now we have finished our animal trials and working towards the final human trials and regulatory applications so we hope to be in the market sometime next year <laughs> and other than that i am also running a project which is a little bit at at, at the preliminary stage in terms of the Readiness, which is for Lightbox, which is also a course project uh, during CAPD uh, during our third <laughs> semester, which is also undergoing animal trials now, which probably would be a much more long-term activity. But nevertheless, I, I think uh, one thing that happened was that I, I mean, I always wanted to build products, but I didn't know uh, that I wanted to do that. Uh, doing the MDA, the CPDM sort of gave me that clarity, and, and uh, fortunately, you know, I found a niche or Uh, alignment of interest uh, in the medical device space which i have been able to continue again back at cpdm itself and um, hopefully uh, there comes a bit of feed moment where we are much more enough to leave the campus and move to a proper facility of our startup but uh, nevertheless i mean i've been enjoying my time here since then continuously and i hope uh, we do some uh, you know give this a logical conclusion to the work we started here at cpdm wonderful and devil is around for people to go and talk to and get his brains on and his journey right i mean it's always exciting yes, that's what we yeah. train people for is that we look forward to people doing more and more startups uh, so thanks again uh, i hope i've not missed anyone oh, yeah i don't seem to uh, is there anyone uh, from the 20th batch that wasn't introduced themselves all right so with that uh, i think we'll move to the panel discussion part and it's a uh, as usual uh we are going a little longer than but i kept 5 to 7:30 so i'll try to close it within the 7:30 period uh so i'll start with the uh, the questions i'll modify them a bit uh we have all talked about design and so we'll keep uh, brief answers but uh each of you have have a story right each of you had a journey so uh, and this is to the panelists now so i'll ask uh, uh maybe vivek and arun to come on the, the camera Uh, and i'll start with arun uh, because you are again we, we keep changing the order so how has your understanding of design changed if at all it has changed uh, over the last since you graduated from cpdm and what you have been doing so i think <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there but but in a sense i think uh, my like i said in my presentation my core of my passion or my uh, world of design revolved around uh, comics um motorcycles and uh, uh, it's it kind of revolved around this uh, you know hemisphere so 
and uh, when i went into the industry uh, i think balaji uh, was touching about it. it's much more than you know uh, uh, just a product much more than just a you know a sketch there's so many attributes that come into it so so the overarching uh, thing i understood that it's it's not just a product we are finally at end making experiences we are telling stories so that's that's uh, it's it's not just a, a form it's not just a you know a, a line it's not just a, a material it's it's the experiences that we are able to transfer from us as designers to our uh, uh, you know clients and customers so that's 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 the uh, uh, thing i would say and having fun doing that uh, if you don't then the, uh, the design as well looks boring so i think it's it's building nice experiences is what it comes down to right thank you so vivek the same question you have had a different journey coming from tech to design so again the same question you know how has your understanding of design evolved uh well design evolved uh, mainly for me in terms of hardware availability uh like uh, i initially was focusing on uh, two dimensional screen as my panel in which uh, visual effects or anything would was happening right that was the beginning part of my journey and then as hardware evolved uh, new devices came new types of experiences came and a new hardware interactive experiences started coming there's actually a really nice uh, book called designing for behavior change in like economics uh, so so, so uh, well while well, virtual reality uh, has had evolved from 2012 and then uh, augmented reality came up came in as well so for, for us it was mostly like what what is value creation uh, for uh, for a person entering into this new hardware era uh, that's that's been one of the biggest uh, thought process that uh, i've been going through or me or my company or even the clients that we work with that's been the that's, that's been the biggest uh, problem statement that uh, we're all trying to learn and adapt right now i don't think we have answers right now on to like what is the best value proposition for a uh, you know for a user in terms of like uh, uh, even movie making like for example there were a lot of evolution in how can 360 degree designs be evolving like gaze like apple vision pro launched a new you know gaze based uh, uh, interactive uh, thing uh, interactive medium right interactive uh, controls for for users right so that 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 brings in like another component of design element that is like a game mechanic for you now uh, how do you use that as a, a mechanic to uh, improve your experience? So it's be, I think it's it's mainly uh, related to hardware evolution. And then uh, personally, for me, it's been uh, understanding psychology of humans and uh, what makes uh, uh, something usable with the least number of button clicks is is what uh, you know we've been going from design point of view. Yeah. Wonderful. So same question. There's a lot going on in my mind, but uh, I'll try to summarize this. I think Arun and Vivek, both of them, they got out the uh, yeah the answers uh, uh, pretty nicely. So I think I was I was I was wondering about this. You know, when we say design, it's about designing an artifact, or how do you about experience? It's not about just the artifact, but on the same note, as you read Don Norman, one of the chapters he has dedicated is how do you design waiting in a generalistic way? Because I think it, it more than how you're designing, possibly trying to understand what you want to design or what you design is possibly a, a great starting point. Then I'm realizing this now because earlier it used to be like what brand and what is this product and all of that. But beyond that, I think, I don't know, I'm just outgrowing that linear way of looking at design as a uh, sort of design something rather than uh, as an artifact to look at a product but rather it, it, you look at the matrix or especially after coming to universal design i just it just blows my mind to think about there's nothing like one size fits all in this in this universe everyone is very unique and then you cannot copy paste you know copy and paste something from here to there because every process everything is very very different unique 
and then it takes a bit of time to understand even this. So in that context, I am just like sort of uh, having a huge, uh, almost I feel like I'm just going back to college. Of course, I've been in college, I'm still in college, but I think I'm starting from scratch many times. You know, it's not like you have this, you know, um, wish or uh, sort of a design that red sports car, you know, because that's how many times we start because you are completely in engineering and then certain things really attract you because when I was in Bajaj, when I just look at some of those nice representation and marker and pastel and some of those Photoshop work, I feel like, oh, that's very interesting, you know. So around that point of time, nothing beyond that. It's just about the product and then how it captivates you. But once you get into the reality of designing an automobile, what it does to you is probably you're looking at it from various points of view. The recent example I came across this where uh, this intersects, you know, sort of a user and the product and the brand and everything. I think Lexus has designed a door pull inside the car. Like we, we, we sort of pull it, the door pull, literally you just pull that. And then you, with your elbow, you just open the door from inside. That's what we, we are so used to. And they, they brought out this change where Semantically, I think possibly you should be able to push and then with the same motion, you should be able to open the door. That's what they did. And one of the concept cars, they are actually, they productionized it too. This is a simple example, which got me thinking. But people are, it's always nice to read the comments from experts also. That people are saying, no, it doesn't work like that. Possibly, though it is a sort of a counterintuitive to pull the door and then push. Possibly you're so used to using your entire arm to open the doors, which is heavy already, which is hinged. You pull and then push like that. It's much more convenient than actually using electric button to push first and then push the door. And how do you, what is the leverage? So all sort of, you know, fight going on in the comment section, which got me thinking, how does it work? And also, if I read further, it says in the event of electronic failure, there's a button inside which makes it mechanical. I think design is about sort of constantly digging through and then trying to sort of get the get the best out of it. I don't I don't see any end to it. It's the constantly evolving thing. If I have to capture this with one word, I think it is design is sort of evolving for the person and for the artifacts or experience, everything. The same product possibly could be in a different context, it could be very, very different in terms of experience here. Maybe around that time, your mood your state of mind could completely change the way I interface with that. So in that context, I'm very confused, but I'm just trying to explain myself to you where it's constantly evolving. And on one hand, I think about this always because I think if I have to quote another person here, it will be David Attenborough, Sir David Attenborough. So he's beautifully mapped the entire sort of a human presence on the earth into one year of calendar year. It's so beautiful. It's very relevant for design, I think. So he says, if you if you if you keep the entire humanity and sort of the time evolution with the Earth as a 4.8 billion years old, and then if you map it on one year, I think for the entire calendar year, four minutes before the new year, the human presence occurred on planet Earth, and two seconds since industrial revolution. It's phenomenal if you look at the time frame. And within that two seconds, I think we're talking about product design, we're talking about aesthetics, function, all of this, all of these things. And we're also trying to connect to how we have evolved ourselves to appreciate certain things. So I would say still evolving. Thank you, Vishal. If I took a little more time, but yeah. same question. Yeah. I think mean, coming from a fashion school, uh, aesthetic was very, very key, you know, because they've the moment um, you look at a product, you look at you look at a garment or a product, everybody will like is looking nice. You know, that's that's the first intuitive question. Uh, how design started for uh, for me? I think over a period of time, we started realizing it's not just aesthetic; it's maybe functions functions bigger. <laughs> uh, when when we looked at a pen like say Lamy, also moved on uh, further and like maybe. That is not it. I think 
maybe the methodology is, is bigger, you know, then finally moved on from methodology into coming, how intuitive could the product be? You know, so I think over a period of uh, two decades, we've seen so much evolution in terms of what, uh, what design as a philosophy could be, you know, like, so for instance, a very, very simple, simple example, uh, just like Lexus, uh, the moment you inside a BMW, you don't have to touch the, uh, to raise this, the, the, the volume in the car, you don't have to touch this, the, the thing at all. You just have to India to just right, uh, right swipe or a left swipe, you know, it was as simple as that. I mean, and, and the, and uh, I think what's for me now it's it's uh, I mean now uh, coming onto a new dimension of uh, you're this thing of urban design. <laughs> I mean, no, not urban design. Sorry, uh, uh, the the one that um, the the one that you're teaching. I'm sorry, universal, universal design. design. Yeah. I mean, the, that's that's a different philosophy altogether, you know. But but for me, what has happened is uh, I think intuitive design. Um, has been uh has become the uh the game for me i think it's it's about whether or not somebody will be able to understand in the first go or not i think so that's from aesthetic to intuitive is uh, where it just kind of uh, moved on to keep the mic which sure. like, uh, started this, this part with you so uh and this is particularly interesting also because uh there's a oh yeah i'll have to take the mic sorry sure. oh, uh, probably, yeah, I think it's just easier to. So uh, the next question is essentially, there's a social view of a designer, right? When you're graduating, you want to be that designer, which the world sees that this guy is a designer, right? Uh, and uh, and so when you're coming out of the college, you're looking for that placement to be seen as the designer that the market sees or your employer sees, and then you gradually evolve your own understanding of design. So... Uh, what is what's your take on how to sort of tackle? So there are many young people who want to be seen as designers, but who also eventually will go as designers. So what's the starting point? And how do you handle? I mean, honestly, I would love to say um, to be seen as a de designer and dress as a designer, but no, that is not the answer. Uh, I think um, what's important to be here to be. Uh, noticed as a designer is uh, is just the ability uh, for you to put a narrative together in terms of uh, what uh, maybe uh, what your background has been, what your uh, uh, where you come from, what you, you know one one thing we uh, which I feel uh, while we were studying in um, in the college and uh what we never put attention to was writing you know like just kind of putting uh the entire scripts together and i think that is uh that is one thing which can uh which can really help you uh not just be perceived but also be more clear in terms of who you are as a person you know and what what your uh what your connection with design eventually will be I think that's that's one thing that I would love to uh, take. Good question. I think what makes you unique is what I would look at possibly because especially, as I said, most of you have done probably your engineering or architecture or something of the sort. The moment you think, okay, you're escaping from that, to design, I think I'm not sure about that. Because there's, there's some level of unlearning and learning happens in the design curriculum because uh, especially master's level, people are completely tied to their background. And I would say it's a balance of, you know, uh, these things, what you learned and then how you are leveraging that. So that will make you a very unique designer because if you're going to just put up a portfolio like anybody else, then possibly, you know, okay, become very predictable. I've seen portfolios like that where somebody was a fantastic illustrator uh, to, to transportation design the first time. I think no one else could match that. It's not just catching the car. Look for Kimberly Wu, okay? He's a 
is a Korean designer uh, who worked for BMW Design Works. BMW, I think, uh, one of my students met uh, Chris Bangle in one of the shows, and he was asking as, an, as a student, saying, how do you rate a portfolio? How do you rate the best portfolio? Then he mentioned about this particular girl who joined BMW from Art Center, and her ability to combine, because before she took up a transportation design, she had no clue of transportation design. But when she combined her sort of her ability to illustrate things beautifully, and then combine a transportation, nobody else could actually match it. So what you bring is something very unique. I think I just second what uh, this friend just said, Pranay said, uh, who you are makes the cut, actually. It's not like you're just joining the rat race and then trying to make things just like look at others and then security and all of the time create the same thing. No, because if you just ask yourself what you're good at, what really drives you, what really motivates you, it could be anything. And if you follow that, if you intersect that, I think you have it. Yeah. Build your stack. We discussed it, right? So build your stack. Absolutely, yes. Uh, right, same question, uh, Arun. Ah, you are taking a pause. No, no. Uh, my earphone kind of died out on me. So I hope right. uh, the mobile speaker is fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. <clears throat> yeah. So I think um, uh, as design students, as uh, you know, uh, young impressionable uh, students, uh, you come and most of the time it's something uh, you're looking forward to that uh, how to create a mark in whatever I do. It could be not just the prof uh, design profession, it could be anything. How do I set my mark? How do I create my own brand or my mark? That's the um, idea that everybody comes with. And that's nothing wrong about it. That's more or less the, uh, you know, it's, I would say, like, how do you become an icon? Any profession you take, if you enter into it, you start thinking about how do I become an icon in this? So just one takeaway. Uh, uh, we were doing a study recently about uh, uh, iconic things, iconic products, iconic people, uh, iconic things, thoughts. So all iconic things starts with something fresh. They set out to do something different when it was not thought of as fashionable or right, or uh, it just set out to do something right for that right purpose. So uh, it kind of was truthful to that, whatever, like um, uh, uh, process. So if you want to be an icon, you have to be first of all truthful to what you do and you have to be different. It's uh, as simple as that. So any any iconic product, let's say a, a Land Rover Defender or maybe a Ducati Monster, or uh, these are products from my run. So they all started to do something different, wanted to establish something different, and then they become iconic stuff. Similar is as a designer, if you want to do or uh, be seen apart or be, uh, you know, identified as that designer or uh, who had that sort of a thinking, who did this sort of product. So uh, put that thinking into your, uh, uh, you know, don't be uh, just a, another chocolate box designer. Don't try to be another uh, me too designer. Let your personality flow through your design because finally the your design will be literally your personality flowing into it. So uh, do different, be different, and that's a way to be iconic, what you do. So that's my take on design. Wonderful. Same question, Vivek. Oh, okay. So if I have to answer in like two words, just using two words, it would be a value and a iteration. Uh, that's what uh, we have to focus on from a design point of view. And uh, to just extrapolate a little bit on value and iteration, uh, we need to focus, is it adding value at all? Wait, software hard. Is it uh, audible? I think my well, headphones well, died. At yeah. All. Yeah. Cool. No. Right, so value and uh, Situations. I think, yes, you absolutely captured that. So given that you brought to the important point, which is two words, so the next question, everyone has to give me short answers. At best, a phrase, right? So two words or a phrase, uh, and, uh, oh, okay, you can't really in that sense. So you have to really keep it short, though, because the question, I've changed the question as I was thinking of it. Uh, so essentially what I would ask for is a uh, key moment in your life, a key event, person, or something that changed uh, a trajectory of your thinking about design, right? Keep it short, uh, but uh, so we'll start with Vivek and go the other way around now this time. 
something well, uh, that really changed your understanding of things sure so i i used to think like uh, you know uh, creatives are like one shot like greatest some uh, especially like in hollywood or like uh, in general i was thinking like people are uh, some of the greatest people who know everything uh, by the time they see at a problem and they'll solve it uh, the the biggest realization or things that i realized was everyone iterates actually and some people have the luxury of iteration and some don't have the luxury of iteration but i felt great creativity comes with iteration rather than a single shot uh, output uh, i i felt that was like a life changing thing that i observed in real world wonderful that was succinct and very precise so arun is lifted the bar for you uh, the question was uh, uh, just please can you repeat i didn't hear it properly. so the question is a moment in i mean an event moment person book something that changed your understanding of design uh, significantly oh um, yeah i think this is kind of easy for me because um, i remember seeing this uh, tv show back in uh, when i was in school uh, 10th or 11th or something like that mm-hmm. and uh, it was uh, it was a show called overhauling where uh, a very famous uh, uh, automotive designer he's a they take vehicles they kind of uh, without the owner knowing about it and they kind of rebuild it and uh, put a, their own design aspect to it and that's a show of half an hour to 45 minutes i forget now but uh, a character called chip foos he is kind of like the uh, you know the workshop head he comes he assesses and he sketches uh, he makes some brilliant sketches with all the required things and the entire team knows what to do and that was the moment i realized that there is something between uh, you know my um, my uh, sketching comics and this automotive thing coming to something sparked in me so that was a big moment of realization that was that was epic chip food wait sure yeah thanks for reminding of the show it's a wonderful show so same question i think two of them um, and this time i'm going to not be precise <laughs> i might uh, <laughs> I think um, the first was a research project we did in uh, 2015 for uh, Kama Ayurveda, and this is the first time we realized that the the value of research is something which everybody ignores. I mean, data is something which designers just tend to forget, and and um, you know this is the a research a qualitative research of some uh, 150 odd people over about. a uh, five month period uh, really transformed uh, the way kama ayurveda was uh, perceived you know so uh, we realized things like people weren't buying the product because they felt the the pricing was too good to cheap to be uh, such a luxurious product you know so much so that they revised the pricing by about 75% you know uh, there were things that we uh, figured out that uh the biggest uh, uh, foreign buyers of a, of kama were japanese who felt the product was too good to be gifted abroad you know uh, uh and these are all parts which came from the research and these were things which were unknown to the brand for the longest time you know so we felt that um, this was one transforming uh, transformation uh, in terms of just the outlook towards this thing and i think the second was a series called breaking bad which was very very uh, you know back in 2010 how uh, when two people are just kind of stuck towards the pit end they kind of uh, transform their life only because uh, because of problem solving you know so yeah these two <clears throat> so we shall now you meant a uh, event or something that inspired yeah, or event something that changed book yeah <clears throat> a trigger i have a strange thing i can't be precise about because uh, it's experience basically right so i joined uh, mid 2011 2012 like a project to head a project for railways it was to redesign the locomotive automotive sorry locomotive interior basically how the local pilots and the co pilots they see they understand we did extensive research we proposed design solutions i traveled to the locomotive uh, works in varanasi you know, all of that i think i got involved in that a, a lot 
uh, to understand really doing a user centered design uh, where they keep their bags and you know what are the visibility you know a lot of ergonomics and aesthetics and material selection everything how how not to slip on the floor ready you store your belongings and everything but one thing got me really uh, you know thinking was our exercise was to design the interior the first thing i looked at was the gabre how do you climb on to the locomotive because if you've seen the specific engine that we work for is WDG4, wide diesel locomotive, uh, 4,000 horsepower uh, locomotive, electric uh, locomotive, electric diesel, diesel electric, which pulls Rajdhani and also freight also it pulls. So I was just going around trying to, you know, make myself sort of climb and all of that. And especially I was really intrigued because we had right there in Sabarmati local shed, we had the one part. So it was impossible to even gra grab the rail when it is parked most of the time outside the platform. And I was looking at people who are short, the local pilots are not always all the time, like you can't just believe them to be like, or take them to be like, you know, built for that. But when I was looking at it, my own personal experience of falling off a train. When I came to India from Mexico for the first time to teach NID, I came to NID and then taught for a week. Then I was catching a train for connecting flight in Delhi. So I just get on the stairs and then Shatabdi is leaving, you know, from Lucknow. I went to meet my brother for a Delhi connection flight. So in the panic, I just climbed down. I've never boarded a running train ever. So I just climbed down the stairs and then I caught the train, moving train, with my laptop bag and I fell between the platform and the uh, train. So almost for 10 feet, I was just dragged along. Yeah, I don't know where these people came from. Three people just came and then pulled me out of the, you know, the in-between thing. And that really just shake, absolutely it's shaken me up forever. I'm very grateful for those people. I don't even know them. But I feel every interface that we have, every experience that we have with things around us, I think is a design opportunity. And that's what got me thinking when I was just designing the locomotive. I'm just looking at checking the, you know, grab rail, whether it is chrome, is it, can I have a, you know, sort of a rubber grip along this and all of that. I think design is many times personal. You, you create things from your person, your personal experience, inventory of experience. And coming back to, you know, universal design, where we look at safety and intuitive use of products and everything. Something got me thinking was Chetan, Chetan, Dr. Chetan, who's a pediatrician in the CMS uh, hospital, Pastor Hospital. He showed pictures of very small kids and children with pencil poked into their eyes and nose. And he said at least once a day or one or two cases every day in the ICU, he treats people for accident, injury. I was just blown away. Pinky finger caught in between the doors, things like that. And then we did a project with him. Some of my students worked with him in the hospital to design things safer for children. For example, sharp edges around the corner of the table. And I think that's a designer's way of being sort of very critical about things. You crib a lot. I think that's a starting point for better design. So these are the incidents I can recollect and then possibly share here. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was a wonderful session. Uh, we just about managed about in time. Um, I mean, of course, usually I try to make it a two hour session, but I've realized with my incapability to hold things, two and a half is a natural way to try and stop. So with that, uh, I thank all the speakers, uh, both okay. online and here. We, we still have another five minutes or less <coughs> sort of an activity. So I'll invite uh, last professor Chakravarti to please come and uh, give mementos and uh, our design ambassador certificates to our design ambassadors. So the idea of design ambassadors is that all our design experts that we invite, uh, our CPDM DM ambassadors, and uh, we have now uh, got them in on our side. It's their job to go and then uh, talk about us, the good things and the bad things to us, but the good things to the others, right? And of course, come back to us whenever we invite them at, for longer sessions. So.
please. All right, so we'll start with uh, Balaji. Yes, let me be here. Photo, 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 photo. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. And we have to also. Yeah, memento. Yeah. 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 We also have to. Be... So, you know, it can't be more emphatic that this silver jubilee of the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. 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 All right. Attention to details, that's good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir. All right, so next we have Pranay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We just put ah. this also. Memento. The chairs. <laughs> I, don't like I think you can move a little this side so that he gets a clear white blank. Be here. Yeah. Okay, we'll come back. All right, so you're asking me to move you out of this. Up. <laughs> He's clearly being productive. Thank you. Thank you. And for the two of you who are listening online, uh, you have to come to CPDM to pick your. Show them. Well, of course. So we have got your certificates. Oh, I hope, yeah. And I have got your mementos as well. Having Thank said you. that, uh, you need to be here to collect it. That's your uh, motivation to come here, right? I will. Hearing clearly? All right, very good. So with that, we'll close it here. Thanks again for joining. Thanks, Vivek, in particular, for waking up that early, uh, hoping oh, yes. that you slept. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'll ask Professor Chakravarti to do the closing rounds. Closing is actually easy. I mean, I'm just going to thank all of you for coming, first of all, and particularly going to thank uh, Professor Vishal and his team, who are quietly, you know, you probably have seen them walking around here and also staff of DM that have been staying there more often than not late into the evening to to enable these things to happen beyond the working hours. So I'm ever so grateful to all of them and you for joining and it's wonderful to see. And as you can see, this is an extremely valuable session. Please buy, even for a moment, do not think that this is only for the designers. Okay, as we discuss, everybody is a designer. The MT program is producing manufacturing designers research program is producing research designers. The all designers, therefore every you know comment that has been made are, are invaluable to us. And I particularly want, want you to remember one point that Arun has made, and that is about aligning aesthetic to functionality. I think the alignment is absolutely critical. And that is for all of you. Okay. Very important lessons from everyone. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Thank you. All right, we close it here. Uh, thank you all for joining, uh, including the 20th badge. It was great to hear from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone.